So, uh, you know, I have to be very brief. So at the very outset, I want to welcome all of you, all the distinguished participants to the uh, second lecture. And we have with us Professor Akhil Bilgrami. I'm sure he's there. And then uh, I'm sure David Bromwich will be there and a lot of other distinguished uh, scholars, teachers and students. All of you are welcome to the second lecture by Professor Kala. I know that you're all eagerly waiting to listen to Professor Kala and therefore I must confess that my introduction is not an in-depth one, but it's just ritualistic or ceremonial in nature. And uh, in fact, uh, Professor Kala is known to all of you, but I'll make some very few remarks about him and then I would disappear so that uh, Professor Kala can take the stage. And for many of you know that Kala is a specialist in literary and cultural theory and French literature of the 19th century. He's a prolific scholar, and many of his works are considered seminal texts. They have had an emphasis on structuralism, theory and criticism, semiotics, and contemporary and comparative literary theory. His doctoral dissertation, Structuralism, the Development of Linguistic Models and Their Application to Literary Studies, became an influential prize-winning book, Structuralist Poetics, in 1975. He won the James Russell Lowell Prize from MLA in 1976 for an outstanding book of criticism. And then in the 1980s, out of him came some classics like The Pursuit of Science, Semiotics, Literature, and Deconstruction in 1981. On Deconstruction, Theory, and Criticism after Structuralism in 1982. Roland Barthes by Oxford University Press in 1982. And uh, Flaube, The Uses of Uncertainty, Cornell University Press, Ithaca, uh, in nine, 1974. And for us today, uh, we should uh, commemorate the book, Theory of the Lyric, uh, by the Harvard, Harvard University Press in 2015. And many of us are familiar with this, uh, another classic literary theory, a very short introduction, which came out in 1997, which got translated into 27 languages. And um, he has uh, a lot of honors and awards, and some of them I'll mention here. He received the Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship in uh, Fellowship, the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. Then he was the president of American Comparative Liter Literature Association and secretary of the American Council of Learned Societies and chair of the New York Council for the Humanities. And he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2001 and to the American Philosophical Society in 2006. And he was on the editorial board of Cornell Literary Journal Diacritics and he became its editor later. And he's having both the training of uh, England and US that he was an undergraduate from Howard and he became a Rhodes Scholar and went to Oxford for his uh, PhD. And in 1977, he joined uh, uh, Cornell as a professor of literature. And in 1982, he succeeded uh, the MHA branch uh, as the class of 1916 uh, professor and chair of the department. At Cornell, he served as chair of the Department of English, Comparative Literature, and Romance Studies. Um, so he has such a prolific uh, you know, writing career and a great intellectual and, and influential academic. And uh, I must end this with a personal note that I have had the rare opportunity of listening to him twice at Cornell University when I visited him. I visited the university for my uh, school of criticism and theory. I listened to his lecture on uh, structuralism and on lyric. So with so much respect and with so much uh, gratitude, uh, it's my honor and privilege to welcome uh, uh, Professor Kallar and also invite him to give the second lecture in commemoration of the bicentenary of Keats's death. Thank you and over to Professor Kallar. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you thank very you, much. Sir. Oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Please. Do you want me to start or do you, is there another stage here? Sorry, sir. Over to you, okay. Maren. 
Ano? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Yes, John Keats, as we all know, was an English romantic lyric poet who devoted his short life to the perfection of a poetry marked by vivid imagery, great sensuous appeal, and an attempt to express a philosophy through classical legend. Today, we have Professor Jonathan Kaller, class of 1916, Professor of English and Comparative Literature, Cornell University, is here to talk about Keats' lyric poetry. Let's lend our ears to him and this promising lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Professor Thomas, for this for that very warm introduction. Um, it's really, it's a pleasure to appear uh, before you this evening virt virtually. Uh, I put on a tie for the first time in practically a year, my first real, first real event. Um, and it's a, it's a really a special honor for me to be invited to speak about Keats on the anniversary of his death since I'm not a romanticist or a Keats specialist at all, but uh, I have certainly enjoyed teaching Keats uh, and I'm very happy to talk about him. So let me share the screen, see if this works. I get it. Hmm. Why is this not? Sorry, let's see what's going on, share screen. Oops. Yes, sir, we can do it. Yes, okay. I hope I want, just want to be sure I got the right version. Yes, okay. And I have this strange mind. So, good. Um, so, for many- Can you turn your video on? Does my video, did it, my video go off when I, yes. Why did my video go off when I shared the screen? Start my video. Yes, there sir, we can see. Okay. okay, and you can you can see me and hear me. Yes. Yes, sir. Good. Thank you. Well, I think for many of us in the English speaking world, Keats represent is really represents the very the very figure of the poet, sort of a pu really a purist poet almost. Um, I think partly, of course, because of his very brief uh, tragic life, uh, dying at the age of twenty five cut off from love, cut off from fame, um, and cut off at an age when um, other major English poets had accomplished uh, really very little. Uh, if, you, uh, if you think about what, if Wordsworth had died at 25, we would probably not be reading him today at all. Um, I've always been struck by this, uh, the strange symmetry of this diagram of English romantic poets, where the, uh, it is, it is where it happened, it's a very weird structure, right? Where the first, the first born uh, was the last to die, the second born was the second to last to die, and Keats, the last born, was, of course, the first, the first to die. Um, well, Keats had a very brief um, period of, what's happened here? Yes, oh, I got the, I'm sorry, this is, this happened before I got it, when I clicked to share screen the wrong, the wrong version of the, uh, of my an older version of the PowerPoint came up. Let me um, exit from that. I can. Yes. Um, let's hope we are now we are now techn technologically successful here. However, Robert, so Keats uh, dying young, of course, and but he also had an, an extremely uh, amazing brief period of productivity from 1816 to 1819, and especially a nine month span in 18, for the first, uh, first uh, nine months of 1819, when he wrote his six of his odes and several, several long poems. And he also, as, as David Bromwich mentioned the other day, wrote wonderful letters, which uh, greatly contribute to our impression, to our picture of him. Um, T.S. Eliot called them the most notable and remarkable ever written by an English poet. And as, as I say, they really do give a, 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 a winning picture of Keats. He's modest rather than arrogant. Uh, and though we speak of his poetry as sensuous, well, lush, uh, he was not a dandy or an aesthete, but down to earth, uh, practical, and a great friend, uh, and of course, of course, an amazing poet. Uh, I think he, and he is dear to us, admirable for us, uh, not only because of the brief uh, tragic life, but also 
uh, because as, as David Bromwich also mentioned, um, he overcame grave disadvantages of class and education. Um, he, he was, as Yeats later put it, uh, as, late, as Yeats later put it in a, in a quotation that's at the bottom of this bottom of this slide, of course, the coarse bred son of a livery stable keeper. And in his own day, the burden of class is very apparent in the reception of his first book, these poems from 1817, which are not well received, just dismissed or as belonging to a cockney school of poetry, uh, sneered at sneered at for political reasons, but especially for reasons of class. Uh, Byron, who greatly disliked his poetry, called him called it shabby genteel, sort of putting on finery, like a, a you know a workman who gets dressed up in a Sunday suit, but uh, and doing. Uh, uh, acting in ways in, that are not appropriate to his class, we say. And he described Keats's relation to literature as that of a boy with his nose pressed against the window of a candy shop, um, which uh, perhaps is not so far wrong. Keats, Keats himself spoke of his relation to fine language as that of, that of a lover. Um, and I'll come back to that point later. But in any case, for his contemporaries, literature was not his birthright. He's, he is out, out, out of place. Um, without further ado, I want to uh, talk about some sonnets and an ode. Uh, the, uh, the sonnet, uh, primarily, of course, is a form of love poetry in Renaissance England, had been revived by Wordsworth, who wrote many of them on a, on a, on a great range of topics. And Keats, too, used the form for all manner of subjects, uh, really very few are about love, and also experimented with the form. Um, here's, uh, here's one. Um, particular, that's a, it's a very striking one. He writes, uh, I've been endeavoring to discover a better sonnet stanza than we had. He, he, he wrote both Shakespearean and Petrarchan sonnets, but he, he found himself dissatisfied with both. And here, this one is worth, worth attending to, uh, the different, different rhyme pattern altogether. If by dull rhymes, our English must be chained, and like Andromeda, the sonnet sweet, fettered in spite of painted loveliness, let us find out if we must be constrained, sandals more interwoven and complete to fit the naked foot of poesy. Let us inspect the lyre and weigh the stress of every chord and see what may be gained by ear industrious and attention meet. Misers of sound and syllable, no less than Midas of his coinage, let us be jealous of dead leaves in the bay wreath crown. So if we may not let our mu the muse be free, she will be bound with garlands of her own. Oh, that's an, an interesting, and, uh, rather remarkable among the among the various English uh, uh, and experiments with the sonnet form. This one seems to be quite successful with a, a more, as he says, more interwoven pattern of rhymes. But I'm going to focus on a more famous sonnet um, on first looking into Chapman's uh, Chapman's Homer. Um, Keats, uh, as I said, was of course not uh, educated uh, as a gentleman would have been uh, at, a, at a public school, etc. He, he did not he had not studied Greek, which was part of the equipment of any aspiring uh, literary man. Uh, but a former teacher showed him the uh, uh, Chapman's translation of Homer, the first serious English translation of of that poet, and which led to uh, this uh, sonnet. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many Western islands uh, have I been with bar which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse I had been told that deep browed Homer ruled as his to me. Yet did I never breathe that it's pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken or like stout Cortez, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. So in this Petrarchan sonnet, the, um, the octave focuses on being told about Homer, hearing Chapman, telling, hearing. And in the Sestet, we have these two similes, both of seeing, when he finally get, is enabled to, through Chapman, to see a new domain. Uh, 
two comparisons, uh, a poem about the power of poetry to produce this experience of what is above all experience of, of silent, silent rapture as stressed in the last, the, 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 the simile that uh, occupies the last four lines, where there's a, even a distinction between Cortez, of course, the explorer in question was actually Balboa, but that's not relevant to the poem, where the distinction between Cortez and his men, the men have not, who have not yet seen the Pacific Ocean, yet are excited at seeing the excitement of their leader who sees it. So a poem, it's a poem about, about mediation at several, at several, several levels. Now, um, so, but the question, one question is on first, on first looking into Chapman's Homer, what's, I mean, what is the effect of this strange title? Uh, it's not called On Reading in Chapman's Homer. And it's sort of flaunting the fact that uh, of course, that he did not know Greek, that he's reading in translation, and indeed and that he's not even reading, really, not, not assimilating, not taking it in, but sort of just caught him gazing at it, looking, looking into the book, gazing at it, at it as a tourist, uh, admiring, um, not doing what Homer, not doing what Homer does in English, but, uh, doing, but gazing, looking into Homer, uh, as I say, admiring Homer as a, as a, as a new continent, as, or as, a, new, as a new planet. Um, there's also, I quote uh, some lines from his sonnet to Homer, which takes up the same, uh, in, in some ways, the same mode. Uh, standing aloof in giant ignorance of thee I hear, and of the Cyclades, as one who sits ashore and longs perchance to visit dolphin coral in deep seas. Again, estranged from this world of Homeric, of, of Homer, of which he has heard so much, which everyone celebrates as the beginning of very beginning of Western Western literature. So here we have a poetic stance of he's speaking not as a confident bard, but as one viewing and listening with us, or viewing, or who who, who is also distanced from the from the, the literary world that he's that he is viewing and, and inviting us to view. A, a, a transmitter of experience, we say, poet offering us poetry as the transmission of a certain transmission of the experience of poetry, or in this case, still the contemplation of the possibility of the transmission of the experience of poetry. And I think much the same thing happens, some, or at least something of the same happens in the case of another art object, the famous Grecian urn. So after apostrophizing, after, after apostrophizing the urn, um, and uh, uh, he, ha he has lots of questions. He is ignorant of what is represented. Uh, and so in the, he's in the position of an innocent, innocent viewer. Um, thou still, I'll read, a, read the first stanza anyway. Thou still unravished bride of quietness. Thou foster child of silence and slow time. Sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What, what men of gods are these? What maidens loft? What my mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? So the questions mutate into, quest into questions that could be taken as ex exclamations, excitement at, what, at the scenes portrayed on the urn. But of course, it begins very clearly with what is, what is, what's this about? What's going on? What is the legend that's being represented here? Who are these people? Are they gods? Are they mortals? Well, where does it take place? What's, what's going on? The sort of reaction uh, that uh, we innocent viewers would have when viewing a Greek vase in a uh, in British Museum, say if we if we didn't have the the uh, uh, informative uh, little placards to tell us what is what is going on, what it, what is represented. So indeed, very much the, uh, the poet speaker here uh, very much is in the position, same position as uh, the uh, as uh, innocent innocent readers or viewers. Uh, is that important to the attraction? Part to sorry, is that important to the attraction that Keats um, has? Uh, has for us. Um, I will put up the, the all the fourth stanza also has a whole series of questions about what is actually going on in this area. And so it's clear that clear that uh, the the the, uh, the speaker is in a position of considerable uh, considerable ignorance, as as the poem to Homer said, standing aloof in giant ignorance, but he he longs to see, longs longs to know what's what's happening. Um, yeah, and I think this uh, this goes along. Um, it, it, it 
go, this goes along, this position in, in some, a number of Keats's poems goes along with his acute sense of belatedness that uh, of course he is young, for him to be a, being a poet means being an audience for poetry, immersing himself in the work of the great, great English poets. Uh, and he feels that burden that Shakespeare, he writes, has left nothing to say about nothing or anything. So overwhelmed by the, by the power of, of previous poets and, and also by the example of Milton, as many, many critics have argued. And in his poem, Sleep and Poetry, he writes, is there so small a range in present strength of manhood that the high imagination cannot freely fly as she was wont of old? That we are, the danger is we are pygmies in relation to these great predecessors, Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Spencer, Shakespeare, Milton uh, in particular. Um, and uh, that's a powerful, powerful force in uh, in, uh, in the work of Keats, if he had lived to be Wordsworth's age, he might have changed and gained in uh, confidence and arrogance. But at this stage, he is he is uh, suffused by feelings of belatedness as a as someone contemplating these great examples of past poetry. But let me now turn to. Uh, I'm not going to talk more about the Ode on a Grecian Urn, but want to talk instead about the uh, about Ode to a Nightingale. So let me say a word about Keats's odes. Um, the um, Odes, uh, classical, uh, classical form. Um, in Keats's case, his his Odes take us distinctive form with a Shakespearean quatrain, uh, the quatrain from a Shakespearean sonnet A B A B, grafted onto the sestet of a Petrarchan sonnet uh, C D E C D E, or some other arrangement of the of the C C and D. C, D, E rhymes. So Ode is a classical form. Pindar, the great Greek Otis, um, the poems of his that have come down to us are poems of praise, of celebration of the victors in, uh, in athletic contests, but which, uh, which evoke the gods, which, uh, 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 which, uh, uh, which articulate value uh, in, in the, while celebrating, while ostensibly celebrating um, uh, athletic, athletic achievement. Um, Ode is characteristically a non-narrative poem, uh, uh, it's, uh, which, is, which takes place in the often in the present tense rather than a, an account of something that happened in the past. Um, in the Greek Ode, so the Greek Ode Odes were recited by a chorus, which would move in one way, and then the next stanza move in the other direction. Uh, and in modern Ode. The progression often takes the form of shifts in emotion or attitude rather than uh, plot development, shall we say. And odes characteristically deploy the figure of apostrophe, the gesture of address, address to entities that are not ordinarily uh, in, uh, interlocutors or here. So urns, birds, uh, uh, Keats has a wide range of wide range, range of addressees here. Oh, attic shape, fair attitude, or uh, uh, thou still unravished bride of quietness, for example. Um, a, a form of discourse that marks this as poetic, as extravagant, not ordinary language. We don't usually address birds. Um, we sometimes swear at our computers, but we don't usually address birds, urns, or especially, um, especially um, uh, emotions. Um, or, um, now, um, and the, well, so one question of what is what is the general effect of these this sort of address aside from marking the discourse as poetry? Of course, a major effect is to anthropomorphize, to take something that is not a listener and make it into a potential listener, something that can be asked to do something or to stop doing something. Uh, in Shakespeare, we have devouring time, blunt thou the lion's paw, etc. Um, or uh, Shelley addressing the west wind, oh wild west wind, asks, not only asks it to hear, but be thou spirit fierce, my spirit, be thou me, impetuous one, and blow my thoughts over the universe, etc. Lots of, of her sublime poets, uh, Odists, um, many, uh, many requests to the, to the powers that are invoked, ap apropostrophically invoked, to, to do this, do that, stop doing this, uh, stop doing that. Uh, Alphonse de Lamartine famously tell us time to stop. Au temps, suspend ton vol, etc. Unlikely, an unlikely command. Time is not likely to hear or to agree, but Vatic poets make commands and requests. Um, Keats is more modest. His odes do not ask anything of the urn. Uh, they do not ask anything of the nightingale. 
of indolence, of melancholy, uh, and even Psyche is in the Ode to Psyche. Uh, Psyche, which is which is already, of course, a goddess, is asked, uh, only asked, O goddess, hear these tuneless numbers and let me be thy choir. So very modest, very modest. Not a not a not a pretentious claim to asking time to stop or or ordering ordering the winds to do something. But the ode deploys elevated language. Um, elevated language, uh, well, I, David Bromwich on, on Tuesday stressed Keats's growth away from fanciful poetry, a resistance to elevated language, a move, move, move towards a poetry of earth, a down to earth. And there's certainly some truth in that, though the, uh, the development, since it's all compressed into a very short time, the development is brief, uh, uh, but Ode to Autumn comes near the end of, the, of this, this sequence. Um, and as I say, there, uh, that Keats's odes do not have the fanciful commands or requests that uh, also often suffuse, uh, suffuse odes. But, but it's certainly true that critics tend to prefer the ode to autumn in part because it is only modestly, modestly fanciful and can be celebrated as a poetry of, a poetry of earth, bringing us back to the, to the real world. But, um, but readers tend to prefer uh, the night, nightingale, I think, uh, and you only have, but it, and whether or not you prefer Ode to Autumn to Ode to a Nightingale, you have only to look at the other odes to see that Keats does love this <coughs> elevated language of poetry, um, uh, uh, sometimes archaic language, um, uh, and, but certainly uh, uh, enough artificial language, which not the language of daily life. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, he writes <clears throat> at one point, I look upon fine phrases like a lover. And in a letter to uh, his friend Reynolds, he quotes Shakespeare's sonnet number 12. When lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, borne on the bier with white and bristly beard, Keats writes, is this to be borne? It's, it's, it's so great, I can hardly, I can hardly bear it. I can, I can hardly, hardly bear this. But in any case, uh, the night, oh, to the night, yeah, oh, to, oh, to a night, yeah. <clears throat> As I said, much loved by readers, extravagant, lush, um, but uh, if, if you and though you, 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 if you like poetic extravagance, this is this and uh, ode on melancholy were likely to be your, your favorites. It's a poem <clears throat> about song, poetry, uh, vision, uh, full of allusions to classical myths uh, and English poets, especially Shakespeare and Milton, in, in particular. Uh, um, poem of dissatisfaction with the world of mortality and mutability and desire to escape and join a world of song, which equated with a world of poetry. I'll read a, I don't, I'll read a few stanzas. That's the time. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> stanza two, stanza, stanza one. Yes. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains, one minute pass, and lethe words had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thy happy, thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. So here, characteristically present tense, uh, my heart aches, not last week my heart ached, and I, but I then I heard a nightingale, it's not, not a narrative, though there is some progression, narrative progression in the, in the poem. <clears throat> a lyric present of a moment that is repeated and that invites the reader to re-speak these words and repeat these words too. I mean, that's part of the temptation of this, of this sort of poetry. We can say, my heart, speak with it, my heart aches. Or, uh, or the third, especially the third, third stanza, fade, 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 far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou amongst the leaves have never known, the, the weariness, the fever, and the fret here where men sit and hear each other groan, etc. But um, this first stanza articulates this strange combination of pain and pleasure, of uh, heartache through, not through envy, but uh, by being too happy in thy happiness and a complex emotion, uh, difficult, to, difficult to articulate. And of course, identify, identify our most feeling of identification with this bird, wood nymph, who the singing, singing of summer, but not seen, but singing. 
The second stanza then gives us a poetic wish, sort of hard to define, a, a taking a wish, wish for a wish for some wine, a wish for a draught of a vintage, uh, a vintage associated with uh, classical poetry, uh, God, God, Flora, the goddess of flowers, Hippocrene, the fountain near Helicon said to provide poetic inspiration, you know, an evocative description of this, the drinking, drinking of this very poetic, very poetic beverage uh, of, as a follower of Bacchus, you know, worth reading again. Oh, for a draught of the vintage that hath been cooled a long age in deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away unto the forest, forest dim. So drinking of, drinking of this wine associated with uh, leaving, uh, leaving the world uh, and leaving, uh, leaving the world leaving the world unseen, both I'm un, I am un, will be unseen and the world will be, will be unseen. Um, stanza three expands on this wish, contrasting here the mundane world and the un, unlocated, unlocated world of the nightingale, which, uh, uh, where, uh, where, where we are, we are, where we are trying to go. And the stanza, then stanza four shifts to another version of the wish, uh, not mediated through wine this time, not charioted by Bacchus and his pars. I'll read the stanza first. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. Already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered about by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with breezes, the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. So um, I'd say another, uh, another version of the myth of the wish uh, to, uh, to imbibe and leave, leave the world uh, following, following the bird. Uh, uh, not so not to drink, but not through wine, not drinking poetic inspiration, but flying on the wings of poesy. This might be to a world of myth, but with queen moon and starry phase, but the viewless wings of poetry seem instead to lead to a lush world without supernatural creatures, a world of verdurous gloom and winding mossy ways. Uh, viewless wing is a strange, uh, strange expression. A, uh, it's a Miltonic image. Uh, uh, the, it comes, comes from Milton, uh, the blind bard, again, Milton, Homer, um, poetry as so poetry as associ associated with um, with flight, but with the uh, with blindness, view, the viewless viewless wind. There's also there are also viewless winds in Shakespeare, so Shakespearean echoes too. But the viewless wing is the important is the important is the important thing here, and uh, it's crucial. Now, so let me and let me offer a brief uh, excursus through an early sonnet. Um, uh, how many bards gild the, la the, laps the lapses of time, which will help to explain, help to illustrate what's happening in the Ode to a Nightingale. How many bards gild the lapses of time? A few of them have ever been the food of my delighted fancy. I could brood over their beauties, earthly or sublime, and often when I sit me down to rhyme, these will in throngs before my mind intrude. And then uh, later, unnumbered, unnumbered sounds at evening store and the songs of birds. So the sonnet says the throngs of poetic beauties that intrude on the mind with no confusion for him. And this may be so for the young poet that he can, he simply, as he sits down to, sits down to write, uh, he's just inundated by throngs of poetic be beauties from the uh, word, phrase, words and phrases from the poems, poems he's read. Uh, so if it may not be confusion for him, but critics find great confusion in this ode in particular, arguing over which phrases echo what, is Beulis wins, is that Milton or is that Shakespeare, um, especially the importance of the relative importance of, echo, of echoes of Shakespeare, of, of, uh, of Milton, 
in is it Paradise Lost more dominant or is it Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, and also Spencer and, and, uh, and other poets, but especially Shakespeare versus Milton and the, the, the sort of confusion in, uh, in critics' minds anyway, as, they, as all these echoes throng, uh, throng before and intrude upon our minds. Um, so poetic composition here is described as uh, uh, thronging the thronging beauties of past language uh, uh, crowding in on his lines and it's evoked especially as in, a, in, in the form of sounds of bird song as birds like bird song uh, un unnumbered sounds um, now I can't uh, don't have time to try to follow through and it would be pedantic to try to follow through numer the numerous evocations um, in um, the um, uh, in the Ode to a Nightingale, but uh, a couple of key words in the second half of the poem are, are highlighted here. Darkling at the beginning of stanza seven, uh, uh, darkling at the beginning of stanza six, and forlorn at the end of stanza seven, and then the beginning of stanza eight, both uh, poetic and, and evocative, evocative terms. So let me start with five. This is one of, often one of the favorite stanzas so you, as, the, as, the, as a, the most lush uh, description of this of uh, this world, dark world and world in which uh, in which the uh, poetic speaker um, has, has to which the poetic speaker has fled following the nightingale so he said been been wafted on the on the viewless wings of wings of poesy um, he's fled the world into the forest dim really a forest of poetic poetic associations he cannot see I cannot I'll read the stanza for us. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn, and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child, the coming musgroves, full of dewy wine. The murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. So that last line is especially is, is one frequently frequently cited as as especially as especially euphonious, if not uh, onomatopoeic. The murmurous haunt of flies on summer's eves with all, all those M's. Um, the um, uh, he's left the world unseen and is brought here by the viewless, viewless wings of poetry. So uh, and there is no light. Uh, so other senses, above all, memory and imagination, are what function. Uh, so this is the poet, a poetry of a memory and imagination, naming, guessing the sweets, guessing each sweet which he can't see, naming the flowers which he can't see. Flowers, which are taken from uh, Shakespeare's *Midsummer Night's Dream*, mostly. So poetry here as an act of naming, of imaginative na recollection, naming, and guessing, and also as an act of listening, as stanza six tells us. Uh, darkling, I listen. Uh, the tonic word. Um, uh, uh, let me well. Let me skip here for a moment. Darkling, blind, blind. Milton uh, identifies his harmonious verse with the song of the nightingale who sings darkling, as he says, uh, and, uh, uh, post and uh, uh, it's, a, it's an important, important, important discursus. He sings, sings, uh, the bird sings darkling. So I'll come back to the stanza. Um, but uh, uh, I think it's important that uh, Keats listens to the bird song as to prior uh, prior poets, whereas Milton identifies his verse with bird song. Uh, this is related to the posture that I mentioned in connection with uh, on looking into Chapman's Homer or on the Ode to the Grecian Urn, where Milton there's the his verse is like bird song, whereas Keats his verse takes the form of listening listening to bird song as he looks into Homer. But let's uh, read the stanza. Um, Darkling I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names and many a mused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. So, so one question is so then so cease upon very evocative moments, recalling 
perhaps Hamlet, etc. But um, the the but there is a question of would this to cease upon the midnight with no pain? Is that is this is this to be desired? Is this a solution? Uh, would this work? Uh, the night the nightingale would continue to sing, but I would have have ears in vain. I would no longer I would no longer hear. So perhaps uh, cannot be counted as a counted as a as a solution. But in any case, um, the um, the, the, let's uh, move on to stanza seven here. Um, so with the, the, where we, the address to the bird. Um, uh, Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. So the bird, dressed to the bird, helps make it something immortal, a figure of myth. It's not a particular nightingale, but. You, you simply when you when you speak to the immortal bird, you, you help to make it make it immortal. Its song is linked uh, both to the Bible, Ruth, story of Ruth, and to chivalric romance. Uh, with these, with this wonderful, sorry, with this wonderful concluding, wonderful concluding, uh, wonderful concluding line. Um, the same oft that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. So, foam of per perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn, where the um, where the, uh, the the word forlorn is determined both by alliteration, fairy lands forlorn, and and the rhyme lorn rhyming with corn, but also picking up uh, on uh, some of the the uh, foam from the previous the end of the pre previous line. It is also a Miltonic word, uh, as like so many words in the key words in this poem. Um, Adam without Eve uh, asks, asks how he can how can he live in these wild woods forlorn? So it's the sound of the word, which the, the sound of the word, which uh, it, words which sounds to him from Milton also with its it calls him back here to its his, his forlorn. It's as though the word has been generated by poetic memory, but then the sound of the word calls him back to his own forlorn condition. Um, and this uh, then this the, the poem raises above all the question of the of the, uh, in the final stanza, the question of the status of this experience, which I was with me. Forlorn, for, the fairylands forlorn, forlorn. The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul's self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, the pie plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? So the question of the status of this experience is left undecided. It's also unclear what is the difference between a vision and a waking dream. They seem rather similar. We would might expect them to be rather similar, but clearly there's there's some alter, an alternative here. Um, much emphasis, of course, has been not on on seeing, not on vision itself, but on listening, on the absence of vision, on on sounds. But the question of uh, so the question about vision here, vision or waking dream, is a question about the entire the entire experience. And there's much crit critical debate. This is a poem that's written about um, a vast numbers of articles and books have been written about this poem. Uh, considerable investment, I would say, in by, on the part of critics in arguing that the poem rejects what has been presented as a cheat, as illusion. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is claimed to said to do in deceiving out. Uh, but I think for, for us, the contrast, the Coleridgean contrast between fancy and imagination makes us assume that imagination is the good term and Fancy is the bad one, but for Keats, fancy is not not a bad not a bad thing. Um, it's, uh, there, but the question of the status of the experience is still is very much very much up in the air. Um, the experience that the but the experience that the poem provides, like the experience of the poet listening to the sounds of prior poetry, is not, I think, one that we want to dismiss, even if we might prefer uh, a poetry a poetry of earth, shall we say? So whatever status we accord to this uh, accord to this like, past experience. We have the same sort of experience of ecstatic listening that is evoked here in the poem, and that poetic event subsists. Um, so um, I admire, and here I admire the observation with which uh, James, a critic named James O'Rourke uh, concludes his, um, sorry, James O'Rourke. 
Uh, here we go. James O'Rourke concludes his discussion of the ode in, Ke in a book, Keats's Ode and Contemporary Criticism, a uh, complicated book or part because it is engaging with all the critical arguments about each ode. Uh, in presenting the exceptionally fluid yet barely structured language of this ode, Keats offers the best access a reader is likely to get um, to a sense of Keats's receptivity to poetry a largely involuntary activity and one that does not translate into the common currency, currency of Saussurian signs, um, sort of not, uh, not straightforward sonic signification, sonic echoes especially. The sonic character of the ode to Nightingale holds out to us the tenuous possibility of being submerged in a wild joining and disjoining of our cultural legacy, proffering an epistemological risk that pays off in the ambiguous capital of moments of imaginative transport that arrive only at greater uncertainties. So we're really working this poem as offering us this ambiguous capital of moments of imaginative transport. Uh, something rather like the, uh, the experience Keats reports in How Many Bards Guild, uh, how many, we looked at before, where is How Many Bards Guild? Uh, here, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, here we are. How many, uh, how, how many bards yield the lapses of time? This, uh, this the thronging of, pa of past poetic phrases into into the mind of the poet as as he as he sits, uh, try, attempting attempting to compose. Um, so as in On Looking into Chapman's Homer and the Ode to a Grecian Urn, uh, the poetic experience that Keats offers us is based on a receptivity to works of art, uh, the, food of his, the food of his delighted fantasy, fancy, as he put it in How Many Bards Guild the Lapses of Time, uh, the food of his delighted fancy, which when I sit me down to rhyme, these will in throngs before my mind intrude. So we, can we too can lose ourselves in these throngs. Well, so, but to conclude, the um, <clears throat> the Keats's long poem, The Fall of Hyperion, opens with a question uh, related to the closing questions of the Nightingale about the status of dreams. Uh, fanatics have their dreams, uh, poets, uh, po uh, but uh, uh, various, various people have their dreams and some can write them, some cannot. Um, but, but, but poetry alone, for poetry, uh, come, come, come. Posey alone can tell her dreams with a fine spell of words alone can save imagination from the sable charm of dumb enchantment. Um, it's uh, so poetry. The question of the status of dreams is, is still remains, even though it's poet. And the hope is that poetry can save the dream from the sable charm of dumb enchantment. So perhaps uh, uh, fancy can cheat better than as well as she is said to do. But that is, but that is the question. And and Keith, but Keith leaves that question open as a question for posterity. The end of this, the end of this uh, uh, first uh, stanza says says that uh, whether the dream now purposed to rehearse in this the fall of Hyperion, whether the dream now purposed to rehearse be poets or fanatics will be known when this warm scribe my hand is in the grave. So it leaves the leaving the question to posterity. Uh, it will be for us to judge. Well, um, several um, several questioners to conclude. Several questioners on Tuesday um, asked whether Keats was obsessed with death. Um, uh, partly, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps thinking about the. Um, sorry, I've got my I'm stuck here. Uh, the part thinking, perhaps, of remembering the lines from Nightingale: "I have been half in love with easeful death." And I think it's worth noting that in those days, Keats' death was was all around, that at age 25, Keats had already suffered first the death of his father, then the death of his mother, then of the grandfather with whom the children, the Keats children went to live, and then the grandmother with whom the children had gone to live, and finally his brother of his brother Tom, who he nursed through his final illness. But Keats did find ways to challenge death. Um, in December 1919, his health was, very, was quite perilous, uh, wastage of his body <clears throat> becoming apparent. Uh, his friend Leigh Hunt remembered that Keats altered his hand, which 
Aunt says, was faded and swollen in the veins, and say it was the hand of a man of 50. In, so in the fall of Hyperion, he had already foreseen the moment when this warm scribe, my hand, is in the grave. Uh, had, Keats had received his death warrant from tuberculosis, and the, the great poems were at this point uh, in December 2018-19 uh, behind him. The sonnets, the odes were all behind him. But he wrote the following lines, which to me are really the most uh, moving of his poems, uh, which uh, these lines before you, which challenge time and which seem to win, I think. This living hand, now warm and capable of earnest grasping, would, if it were cold and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights that thou wouldst wish thine own heart dry of blood, so in my veins red life might stream again and now be conscience calmed. See, here it is. I hold it towards you. So the address to the reader flaunts the poem's ability to make such address into an event. And it's a daring attempt to produce a poetic event by exploiting the resources of direct address to the reader, boldly collapsing into one, the time of articulation, the now when this living hand is warm and capable of earnest grasping, and the time of reading. See, here it is, I hold it towards you. Uh, holding is uh, holding it towards us through the, through the poem. So it conjures the present of writing into the future and present of reading. The poem dares assert that this hand is being held towards us at the moment of reading. And, and we might expect to smile ironically at this misplaced pro poetic pretension I and mean, the claim to survive the icy silence of the tomb and reach out to us here and now. But seldom do readers react in this way. Certainly in my experience, people do not sort of mock this poem. So how, how, how silly, of, how foolish of Keats uh, to think he could, the hand could escape the tomb. Rather, we seem to accede to the poet's claim, uh, uh, poem's claim, granting it the power to make us imaginatively overcome death, the death with which it simultaneously threatens us. So, in effect, contrasting the poet's life with the poet's death, it proleptically claims that if this hand were dead, uh, it would haunt us and make us wish to transfer our blood to it, if only that would make it live and make and so make us uh, wish to uh, make, uh, make us and we would feel better for it. So while we don't actually uh, wish to sacrifice ourselves, readers do tempor temporarily at least sacrifice their sense of reality in allowing the poem to create for them a temporality in which the hand lives and is held towards them. The poem predicts this mystification, dares us to resist it, and shows it to be, I think, irresistible. Well, it's a tour, tour de force that shows what lyric can do and why it is memorable. Thank you very much for your attention. So I will now stop the screen share and go back to full screen. Thank you so much for this amazing lecture. Thank you very much. Now it's time to move on to the Q&A session. Marin and I would be reading out the questions simultaneously. Uh, dear professor, in case you are unable to hear us due to any sort of technical issue or lack of clarity, do let us know. We will repeat the question for you. Certainly. Mm -hmm. First question is by Yazid Bahas. What is the paradigm shift in Keats poetry in relation to the romantic movement? Heavens, <laughs> a big question. What is the paradigm shift? I'm not sure that there's a paradigm a paradigm shift. Um, you know, Keats, be, partly because his life was so brief, uh, he uh, uh, he uh, he didn't he didn't you know if he, we don't have any idea really of what he would have gone on to do, whether he would have continued to, to to focus on poems on odes and sonnets, or whether he would have devoted himself more. Fully, more heartily to the to the epic. Um, he uh, started, of course, an epic Hyperion and gave it up to to uh, to to write instead the fall of Hyperion, much a shorter a dream dream vision. So it's very conceivable that if he had lived longer, he would have taken it in that direction and and attempted to 
uh, write a different. I, I, I write a different sort of different sort of poetry. Um, for me, I guess what is I mean, Shelley also is a master of the odes. So Shelley and Keats. I, I, I guess I don't think of Keats as having a, brought about a paradigm shift, especially since he's right in the middle of the the Romantic movement that uh, Wordsworth uh, preceded him and and followed him as did as did all the others. Um, uh, but uh, Keats, uh, you know, Keats achievement is one uh, for me, uh, especially uh, in the odes and, and the sonnets. Uh, I'm not such a partisan of the of the long of the long poems, the dream visions. But um, sorry, I don't, don't really have more to say about that question than than, than that. Thank you, sir. Uh, second question is from Jagridi Upadhyaya. My question is, how does the dreamlike world created by Keats in La Bella Damsan's Mercy or Eve of St. Agnes or the Nightingale or, or the Psyche give it its lyrical quality or is it vice versa? Am I clear? I'm sorry, no. How, how does how this... this... Oh, know, but, I, no, can you can you try to re, can you repeat the question? I will. I... Oh, sure. Sir. The question is: How much does the dreamlike world created by Keats in Dabella Damsan's Mercy, or Eve of Saint Agnes, or the Order of the Nightingale, or Psyche, give it its lyrical quality, or is it vice versa? Hmm. Oh, I see. I don't. I don't really think it's one or the one or the other that the uh, uh, the, the the lyrical quality inheres in this vision. You can you can, <clears throat> of course, a, a poem can have a lyr lyrical qualities without being a dream vision. But uh, the dream and the dream vision, these two things, Keats certainly the two things the two things go together for him. The dream vision does seem to uh, involve. Uh, uh, lyrical, um, considerable lyrical quality. Focus on focus on the lyrical quality. Um, you know, I would be hard put to give grant priority to priority to one or the other. Um, but, um, Next question is by Ashish Chetri. Or to a nightingale seems almost to be death crossed beginning with the image of let progressing to easeful death and rich to die. Is the speaker expressing a death wish? What could account for it? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's, a it's certainly a complicated uh, issue, isn't it? The, uh, the uh, now um, you know, the, the, the formulation that uh, now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease, cease upon the midnight with no pain while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy, still would thou sing and I have ears in vain. So the idea that uh, the, there's certainly a temptation there, right? To if you feel that you have you you have have entered some kind of idyllic, idyllic state of uh, embalmed in darkness and listening, listening to the sounds of to prior poetry, to the bird, whatever, however we want to characterize it, um, that uh, that uh, and if you contrast this with the world of with the world of pain and sorrow that has been uh, outlined uh, outlined in uh, in stanza in stanza three, then the temptation wouldn't it be nice to uh, simply to uh, to sink into this sink into this darkness. Uh, uh, and uh, with no with no pain, so could be a, could be a death could be a death death wish, but it's certain. But it's only it's only a momentary one. He draws back, saying, "Well, the death disadvantage of that would be that uh, you would keep singing, and I would not. I, I would have I would have ears in vain." And uh, uh, that's uh, so. And, but it's uh, it's certainly understandable um, if. Uh, uh, and there are certainly, I think, critics certainly have argued that there are echoes of Hamlet here, where it's, does Hamlet really have a death wish? No, Hamlet, uh, Hamlet medit thinks about it, uh, thinks about it, uh, to be or not to be, that is the question. But uh, I don't, we don't seriously think that uh, Hamlet is going to, is going to com commit suicide. Uh, the play would be a very different play, and he would be a very di a different character if he, if he were to, to do it at that, do it at that moment. So, um, the, uh, to say what accounts for it uh, in the in the in the poem, there are two different questions. Would there be? Uh, I, we, I don't think there's evidence from Keats's letters that he actually uh, had a had a death wish. He he knew uh, that he was likely to die. Quite, I mean, his his the dying his 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 illness 
um, lasted for some some years, and uh, and uh, tuber other, others in his family had died of tuberculosis, as he eventually did. So it's a, it was death was certainly on the horizon, and one could imagine thinking, "I'm going to die soon. I might as well, um, if I could ease upon the, cease upon the midnight without pain, that might be a desirable might might be a desirable outcome." But um, I don't. The letters do not uh, certainly give us a. a a picture of a suicidal suicidal person. So the question of whether we're talking about Keats having a death wish or the, the poem, the state of the poem induce, associating uh, a, a thought, thoughts of death with this uh, paradisical, paradisical state uh, retired from the world in uh, in embalmed darkness, uh, counting the sweets and thinking, uh, listening to the, listening to song, listening to poetry, and thinking one could simply stay in this con condition and 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 quietly pass on. Uh, that's a different question. Thank you so much for the reply, Professor. Moving on to the next question. Uh, this question is from Master Shaukatali. His question is. Was Keith sanguine about his poetic ca capabilities and was he paradoxical while saying we were swings of poesy but actually viewing its power in him? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in, I think he was uh, sanguine about his power. I mean, he was, as I said, he did feel that, uh, uh, you know, all these great poets had come before him and, and, uh, and can, is there, are there things left to do that I can, that I can do? And certainly for him, writing poetry was um, not a matter of simply looking at his heart and to look, look in your heart and write. It was a matter of, of producing the kind of discourse that prior poets had produced, letting this these prior prior beauties echo uh, in his mind as he as he as he composed. So it's very much that. And whether he in doing this he would be able to rise to the uh, to the properly to the occasion and achieve what he uh, what he hoped. Um, uh, it's uh, certainly moments when he was very, was pleased with his with poems when he he, he sent um, when when he sent Ode to Autumn to a friend. He said, "Since you like poetry, he, here this this is since you especially like poetry, this is here this is for you." And um, at, as uh, as David Bromwich uh, quoted uh, on Tuesday uh, uh, near uh, at near that near the time of his death, he. He did say, "I think that I shall be among the English poets." That he was convinced that he had he had made a made a contribution that would last, even though on his on his tomb in the Spanish uh, in the English cemetery in Rome, he uh, he had the the, 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 the inscription here here lies one whose name was written in water. But uh, no, I think I keep, think Keats did did feel uh, confidence in his poetic powers. Uh, he gave up his his uh, his. Uh, his, to train, he trained as an apothecary, as a druggist, and gave that up really to to focus on focus on poetry as much as he could. And uh, and certainly, uh, we, though though the first book was uh, uh, had a lot of negative reviews, negative reception. His friends were more were encouraging, and uh, he he saw that what he was doing was what what he was doing was good. I think. Next question is by Deep Shika. How could we contextualize romantic theory of self in the development of modern psychology? Mm -hmm. Contextualize, big, a big question. Well, certainly one of the one one of the features of the romantic period, um, as what we characteristically uh, uh, do, is the is a new uh, sense of the, uh, the robustness of the of the individual subject so as as a new uh, as as an as an object of object of attention. Um, uh, one mark of that is might be um, the fate of. Um, Really the fate of fate of the situation of lyric poetry, the status of lyric poetry in the Romantic era, um, prior to the Roman, Romantic period, even though lyric had been widely practiced in uh, Greece and Rome and the in the Re in the Renaissance, etc., um, it still did not. Um, did not have a status equivalent to that of epic or epic or tragedy, uh, in part because the ruling genius for literary theory was still Aristotle, and Aristotle's poetics is a mimetic poetics, an imitation a poem as an imitation of action. Uh, lyric was not an, seemed an imitation of action, so it seemed a minor a minor kind of form. Um, but the argument began came to came to be made in the late 18th century, the, sort of the beginning of the Romantic period, that actually um, this was. 
Rose's uh, lyric was an imitation of the action of the individual subject, of the, the thought and feeling of the individual subject, and that this was, uh, was a, a valid and indeed very highly significant form of uh, form of imitation, uh, and um, and so the lyric became in during the Romantic period. Uh, even though poets like Wordsworth and uh, and and Shelley and even Keats uh, still tried to write epics, which was the most highly uh, high, well, high, highly valued um, uh, poetic form, uh, lyric came to be uh, more widely admired, more widely written, and in seen in some sense as as the essential form of poetic expression, uh, lyric as ex express, and this enabled us shift from uh, poetry as mimesis to poetry as expression, uh, which uh, um, a shift that M. H. Abrams traced in his uh, famous book, *The Mirror and the Lamp*. The poet, poet, uh, from poem no longer a mirror uh, holding a mirror up to nature, but a lamp illuminating the world, illuminating the, as an expression of the of the of the of the individual subject. And even so, Wordsworth's epic, of course, is presented as not an epic of the founding of England or anything. Uh, so not 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 uh, comparable to the Aeneid or something of that sort, but um, the uh, the growth of the poet's mind. So it's a it's a, it's a self centered epic in that sense, uh, focused on the on the individual on the individual self. So yes, I think a, a sense of the of the uh, Im the importance of uh, the individual self as the basic unit of of uh, of uh, human existence uh, comes into really comes into its own in the uh, in the in the Romantic period. Um, this is accompanied, of course, by a sense of then uh, questions about the status of that self. Uh, Keats is famous for you know, his claim that the, po the poetical character, the poet has no character at all. But the, the poet does is enables himself to puts, can, puts himself into various, uh, various cells, various positions. And uh, uh, that's uh, so the certainly the centrality of the self goes along, along with the centrality of the self goes along a questioning, a questioning of the solidity or the unity of the self. I'm speaking, am I speaking too fast and answering these questions? Should I try to slow down? It's okay, it's okay, fine. It's okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Can we move on to the next question, Professor? Yes, sorry. Yes, sorry. I, I, I finished. Yes. Okay. Next question is from Piyush Ravel. His question is, what are your views on Keats as a dramatist? As like his contemporary romantics, he too exper uh, experimented with the medium of drama on which England's, England's national reputation hinged. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I'll have to pass on that question. I've, I've never, never really worked on drama at, at all, and especially not on Keats, Keats and drama. Um, so it's, uh, you need to, you need to put that question to someone who has, has more, more knowledge. I, uh, I've not, uh, I've not read, even read Keats's um, attempts at drama. Next question, please. Next question from, is by Josie Joseph. For most of us, the name Jonathan Color is invariably associated with theory. I mean, mm. we learned our structuralism, semiotics, and deconstruction mainly by reading your books. And today, we just got a traditional lecture on Keats poetry. Hence, I wish to put a question at once personal and methodological to you. Was it a conscious decision or nostalgic compulsion that you chose not to indulge in textual intermediacy or the play of signifiers, but instead plunge into an aesthetic or emotional interaction? Mm -hmm. Well, um, certainly this is not it's not a high, highly not a theoretical very theoretical lecture. On the other hand, certainly uh, the argument my argument about. Uh, uh, about Ode to a Nightingale is one about indeterminacy uh, that I'm resisting the frequent critical attempts to um, find in it a, a reassuring conclusion that Keats is rejecting this the world of fantasy, etc. Um, and uh, and the, the, the quotation with by James O'Rourke, which I with which I ended, is very much goes very much in that direction. Um, O'Rourke is someone who is uh, who is. Uh, uh, 
whose account, whose engagement with Keats is highly informed by a recent recent critical theory, and that quotation that I that I offered is 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 very much so. Um, also, it, it, this the account of the Ode to a Nightingale really does stress the 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 play of the play of sound in particular, this play of play of poetic past poetic sounds as as the source of uh, Keatsian uh, Keatsian discourse, listening to sounds. Uh, and so I, I guess I don't think of this as a as a non as a as a trad traditional and uh, non theoretical lecture. I'm sorry that you found it found it so, and I hope it wasn't too disappointing. Moving on to the next question, uh, the question is from Ayan. Do you think the concluding stanza of the poem? Or to a nightingale is on the same level of excellence as the other stanzas. Is it a good ending for the poem? I think it's a good ending for the poem. Um, same level of excellence. Uh, yes, it's not. I mean, it's it's not uh, it's not as evocative of uh, as uh, shall we say as. Uh, as stanza five, the the lushness of the the, the language there, uh, just, just read it, but it has a different function in the poem. So yeah, I think it's a. I, I guess I don't. Uh, um, I don't particularly want to. I don't, uh, yeah, I, I do find puzzling, as I as I as I indicated, I do find puzzling puzzling the uh, um, the question about um, the, um, the, the the distinction between um, um, a. Uh, a vision or a waking dream, um, and so perhaps uh, in an ideal world, I would have liked a different, a slightly different, oppos differently formulated opposition there. But uh, but pray it may well be that the purpose of that is precisely to po give us an opposition that may not actually be one. That uh, we, we have a choice. What what do we what do we think of this? Uh, uh, what do we what do we think of this uh, this experience that we have that we have been given and that we have. Uh, we have seen the poet, uh, uh, see, seen the poet's poet speaker um, experiencing, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's too. If you had a clearer, more articulate opposition, that would would might perhaps might force a different kind a kind of decision that would be would be inappropriate. Because I think that as I as I as I said, and as as O'Rourke's uh, final comment says, I do think that um, uh, one a good way of thinking about this poem is that it is giving us it is helping giving us. Uh, getting us as close as we can get to hearing uh, what Keats would hear. Um, we can't hear what Keats hear, it'll hurt, obviously, but uh, uh, we can get what, what Keats would hear in prior poetry and and that experience of the ecstatic experience of having these uh, these poetic fragments, these poetic po poetic echoes echoing in in the mind as as uh, uh, as birdsong as um, Etc. So no, I think it's uh, I think the, the the final stanza is is uh, is a is a good one. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to thy my soul self, and uh, is a is a good line. And and the the, the withdrawal the it's the crucial the withdrawal is crucial. It's not that suddenly he switch just switched off. The plaintive anthem fades and it recedes into the recedes into the background. So next question, I guess. Next question is by Mankesh. Can we study pictorial quality of Keats in association with psychoanalysis? Mm -hmm. We can. Uh, David Bramich uh, avoided that question yesterday uh, on, on Tuesday and passed it on to me, but uh, I really have not read, read much um, psycho psychoanalytic discussion of Keats. It certainly would be possible. Um, you know, it's, uh, any, any, uh, uh, any any rich uh, associative discourse is 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 certainly open to uh, reading in, ter in psychoanalytic terms, and uh, I have no particular resistance to that. I'm not sure. Well, the question would be: Are you are you thinking of it as psychoanalyzing Keats? Are you thinking of it as psychoanal as a as a, a psychoanalytic investigation of the poetic process? That would be more, I think, in my view, more valuable. But uh, um, it's not a um, it's not so uh, not, the psych major psychoanalytic themes, shall we say, are not not necessarily so obvious. Except, uh, I don't know, perhaps that of a death death wish. But uh, but I think. Uh, I mean, because I think the the realm of that which we are operating here is not so much one, uh, a realm of of sexuality as a realm of uh, of, of, of associative uh, of associative language. But, uh, 
Yes, so we can pass to the next question then. Next question by Rupsta Banerjee. In writing of death, Keats' lyric voice appears as a ghostly presence in his own poetry. Are the evocations of dream worlds a way of rethinking the lyric present? Are the evocations of dream worlds a way of what in the lyric present? What's the verb there? Are the evocations of dream worlds a way of rethinking the lyric present? Reaping in? Reaping in. The lyric present. Reaping in. I'm not, I'm not sure about what quite what reaping in would be. Um, certainly, uh, the associated dream worlds go along with the lyric present. Yes, that this is a, that's the, the attempt to and the, the inhabit the inhabiting the, the inhabiting of a of a of a world of whether it's a world of dream or a world of simply a world of, of po po poetic associations and and so sonic fragments and uh, and uh, and harmonious numbers as we as we as we say. Um, but uh, yes, that goes along with the lyric present. I'm, I am quite interested in the lyric present, this strange um, lyric, na this now of lyric, lyric poetry, which is rather, rather distinctive, really. Um, we, uh, um, if I had talked about the uh, Ode, on, uh, Ode to Autumn, um, I could, we could, it's that, it's very interestingly illustrated in the in the uh, in the concluding stanza where the red breast whistles on a garden croft whistles as opposed to I mean we wouldn't say that in English the red breast whistles uh, we would say the red breast is whistling or the red breast whistled yesterday it was whistling is when I heard it heard it this morning or in general the red breast whistles but um, it's uh, that that's when the red breast sings it whistles there there are different uses of that. Of the of the present present tense there, but the lyric present is a bit different. It's 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 both it's sort of iterative and uh, uh, but it's a for at a particular moment the, the 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 certainly the fiction of the poem is that now now at this moment which is a, both a moment in the past and a moment whenever the poem is read by anyone now the red breast whistles in the garden croft um, and that's it, not just that the red breast is whistling but the red breast whistles that it's it has a kind of typifying uh, Iterative quality that is quite quite distinctive and uh, and is is uh, feature a feature, major feature uh, of of lyric poetry as opposed to other poetic uh, other poetic modes. I think that the, that that particular um, sort of timeless uh, uh, it's not exactly a timeless present because it's a present that's very much of time, but um, but a time that is that is an iterable time. Anyway, but yes, the green vision and the and the, that lyric present go together very well. Next question. Professor, actually, we have come to end of the session. Mm -hmm. We have come to the end of uh, the Q&A session. Um, thank you so much uh, for patiently answering all the questions. Unfortunately, uh, due to the time constraint, we couldn't ask all the questions. And we sincerely apologize uh, for that. But we ensure that all the questions will be directed directly to the speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to take part in this celebration of the uh, of, of Keats, John Keats. Now I invite Mr. Anish K. Joseph, Assistant Professor, Department of English, to propose vote of thanks. The distinguished speaker for today, Professor Jonathan Kalu. Our guests, Professor David Bromwich and Professor Akhil Wilgrammy, the head of the department, Professor Peter Thomas, convener of the bicentenary lectures, Father Jos Jacob, faculty members, and all dear and respected participants from across the globe. Greetings to you all from the Department of English, St. Bergman's College. As the lecture series organized by the Department of English, St. Bergman's College, uh, to commemorate the bicentenary of the death of John Keats comes to a close, we are filled with a sense of gratitude to the veteran scholars who have been associated with us. Professor Jonathan Kallu, class of 1916, Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Cornell University, delivered the lecture titled as Keats Lyric Poetry. And through this lecture, he could take all of us through the beautiful 
realm of lyrics, especially of sonnets and odes. Professor Kaller started his lecture by expressing the happiness he has in teaching kids. Indeed, he was gracefully expressing this happiness as we travel together through the viewless beings of poetry, uh, through his readings of poetry and his uh, discussions. He also presented the critical approaches to the reading of Keats' poetry. He also responded patiently to the queries from the participants on the varied aspects of Keats' poetry. We express our heartfelt gratitude to you, dear Professor Kaller, for your gracious presence, moving lecture, and patient responses. Professor David Bromwich, the Sterling Professor of English at Yale University and the speaker of the first and also Professor Agil Bilgrami of Columbia University have been present throughout this lecture too. Both of them have been good friends of the Department of English, St. Bookman's College for many years and uh, most of us here have been fortunate to listen to them many times, both offline and online. Thank you, dear professors, for your kind association with us. We look forward for your presence in our campus again in the future. Professor Peter Thomas, the captain of our ship of the Department of English, has been the chief person who has been instrumental in bringing scholars of international repute to our campus. Mm -hmm. Time of the pandemic has indeed been uh, uh, made highly ac academically engaging uh, with the tireless initiatives of Professor Thomas. Thank you, dear sir, for your uh, leadership and guidance. I also thank Father Josh Jacob, the convener of this lecture series, uh, for coordinating effectively the various uh, uh, technicalities and details of this lecture series. I also thank uh, the faculty members of the Department of English for uh, directly and indirectly contributing to the effective organization of the series. I should also thank uh, Marin and Christina of the, the first May students uh, for uh, hosting this, uh, this second lecture. Uh, I also thank uh, Mr. Uh, Dan and Mr. Tojo for uh, helping us with uh, the technical aspects of uh, this meeting. And Finally, as I conclude, I must thank all the participants who have been with us uh, on both the days of this lecture series, uh, teachers, researchers, students, and literature enthusiasts, and also uh, many lovers of poetry from uh, different parts of uh, the world. Thank you all for being, uh, for being with us, uh, for, uh, for traveling along with us through the world of Keats poetry. Let us all come together uh, in the future too for, with other initiatives of the Department of English. Thank you all, I remain. Thank you, sir. We have come to the end of today's lecture. It was indeed a pleasure to have each and every one of you and on the screen. Feedback forms are provided in the chat box. Make sure to give your valuable feedback. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McGrammy. Thank you, Professor Kala. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you, Bromwich. Thank you so much.